thank you everyone for uh, for coming. Um, for Bridget, Whitney, and myself, this has been a labor of, um, of love. Uh, we have dedicated a few years um, to investigating uh, sustainability, racking our brains, um, hitting walls of uh, not knowing what to do. Um, so we hope that we can bring that, uh, that experience um, here on the table, uh, virtually and in person, and then engage to see what your experience uh, uh, has been like. Some of you may be at a different uh, journey than us. Some may have done uh, ex post or post program evaluation. Some here maybe are just um, trying to get on this journey right now. Hopefully, we can learn uh, all from from one another. Um, again, just to lay a little bit of uh, the ground rules, um, we have two presenters that are in person and we have one online. The person online will be monitoring and trying to help um, answer questions that come from participants. Uh, we will not be doing any, a formal introduction. And um, the reason for that is a little bit of uh, the dynamics that we have found with uh, post-program evaluations, where there are prior dynamics. Uh, at play, and there is a, a little bit of the intimidation of uh, can I say this in front of USAID or can I say this in front of my uh, supervisor? So we'll kind of gonna leave it out, but feel free if you want to um, say uh, examples from your organization, it's up to you. Like, we'll leave it um, to that. With that in mind, we'll start with the first. Um, I wanted to check out uh, in the room. Uh, first, and then also for those uh, that are online. For those of you that are online, uh, please, only if you uh, can answer the statement with a yes, enter it, and Bridget will be counting. For those of you in the room, if I can, if you can raise your hand, if your organization or unit um, has conducted at least one uh, post-program or uh, ex-post evaluation in the last five years. Yes. Okay, about half of the room. And just type in, uh, and Bridget can do a count on. So we have at least like five um, uh, people in the room that have done about half our space, more than half. Okay. Oh. Okay, we have eight online. So good, we got some people that have some experience. Uh, can we go with the second one? Now the question is again the same. Um, Raise your hand or, or type in yes if your organization has shared externally at a conference, uh, on a website, or on a paper, some of the findings from the last ex post evaluation that you have. Publicly available conferences or websites. Yes. Okay, we have uh, in the room, we have one uh, person. In the process, I'm not yet. In the there. process, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You won't find anything from World Vision either, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, what is it online, Bridget? We have five, five online. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, well, what about this kind of another take? Your organization has shared publicly. So these are, uh, they have been shared at the conference. This, sorry, this was a, a more comprehensive finding uh, from the evaluation, have been shared publicly. The first one was more externally, conferences, methods, maybe, or websites. Is it the same number? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's the same number. Okay. Okay, we have two more questions similar to this. Um, how many of those that have um, shared or done exposed, even if they haven't shared at a conference or online, can say that their organization has applied the learning uh, internally. Yes. We have some uh, hands uh, shaking on a maybe, so not a full yes. Uh, we have two hands that are half raised, and we have one that is fully raised. So, okay. And we have folks online that are saying they've tried to or they've done this somewhat. Okay, okay. You'll learn about our internal sharing very soon. Um, last one is um, your organization has plans to conduct at least one uh, ex post evaluation in the next two years. So you are planning to do something. 
Okay, we have yes. um, three people. Um, what is interesting is that uh, we don't have the same hands raised uh, between the people that have done them um, and the people that want to do them. So maybe let's keep that in mind um, as we discuss why we don't see more of those hands that have done it, uh, saying that they will also continue to do it. <laughs> What's the online version of, of, or answer, Bridget? We have four, four people uh, online who said they planned an next post in the next two years. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for um, the honesty uh, and for participating. I hope it also gave you a feel of uh, who's in the room uh, that has done something or where the as a community we stand with uh, talking about expos or sharing about expos. Bridget, I'll pass it to you. Okay. Are we on the next slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so why why conduct ex post evaluations? Uh, we're speaking about this topic both generally uh, for you all, but also through the lens of our experience at, at World Vision. Um, so uh, at World Vision, in, in, we made the determination that it's no longer appropriate to take for granted that successful programs are going to continue to be successful after the program closure, which is, which is something that was kind of expected for a very long time uh, at World Vision. Um, and, and also, um, it has, has, has historically been the case that although World Vision made statements to donors about the expected long-term benefits of their programs, they really only held programs accountable for goals during the life of the program. And there's um, uh, a shift in dynamics with the organization that we don't we don't want to behave like that anymore. We want to hold programs accountable for goals after a program closes. In a recent, very comprehensive literature review carried out by Valuing Voices, uh, only 17 agencies had publicly available project evaluation reports, and most of those, with the exception of OECD and FICA, uh, only had one such publicly available ex post evaluation report. Um, and it was the conclusion of the Valuing Voice literature review that in the $137 million international development industry, some 99% of projects remain un unevaluated after project closes out. Um, and as we know from partially your attendance in this presentation today, but also in other conversations that we're having with our peers at conferences, um, and we're seeing within journal uh, submissions, as well as um, funding releases from, from uh, uh, individual donors and major donors, there are a lot of questions surrounding the long-term impact of, of aid. And this question of what happens after a program closes um, is, is, uh, ha has a, 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 growing, a growing interest in the last few years. So on this next slide, um, we're going to show you a little bit about um, something that we're going to talk uh, more in depth about over the course of this presentation. But this is a snapshot of the recent ex post evaluations that World Vision US has uh, funded and carried out. They were done in two rounds. Round one had data collection primarily in the calendar year 2015. Um, and that was uh, three programs evaluated. And they're listed as, um, you'll see the names here, one in Uganda, one in Kenya, one in Sri Lanka. They're listed as ADPs, and that signifies that these are long-term 10 to 15-year programs, um, multi-sectoral programs funded by child sponsorship. And so the goal really is to promote the well-being of children, their families, and their communities. Um, in the round one ex post evaluations carried out in 2015, uh, some things to note are that you'll see that um, the years elapsed between when the program closed and when uh, our teams got to the field to collect data tended to be between three and four and a half years. And the final column there on the right, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the key features of these programs. Um, there are many other features to, uh, to all of the programs listed on this slide, 
Um, we've just captured a few here so that you can get a taste for what they're like. But like I said, they're multi-sectoral programs. And for those of you who don't know that annotation in Uganda and Kenya, COH for HIV, that stands for Channels of Hope for HIV. It is a current project model used by World Vision um, that uh, works with um, congregations to form um, volunteer committees that uh, either facilitate or carry out uh, prevention, care, and other support services for uh, families and individuals affected by HIV. So that was, so, so like I said, we had three in round one. Um, among somewhat older sites uh, where there's a larger amount of time elapsing between the site closure and the data capture. Round two, all of the data collection were carried out in 2017. Uh, we did six ex post evaluations in 2017, two in India, three in Myanmar, one in Bolivia. The thing to note here is the difference uh, in the years elapsed. And we'll talk about this uh, in a few minutes, uh, why we made this decision, but it was a very strategic choice to pick more recently closed programs and to go to the field and, and do that data capture uh, uh, sooner after the program closure. So you guys, we will, um, I don't want you to forget about what, you, um, uh, what we just talked, but we're gonna switch gears a little bit more to unpack a case study. And um, this is a real, um, this is a real intervention that was part, uh, that was part of the interventions that were delivered um, in Rakai in, um, in Uganda in that, uh, in that one program. And we want to use um, uh, this case study uh, to discuss it with you because it exemplifies some of the methodological challenges uh, that you could encounter as um, evaluator in, uh, in the next book. Um, uh, setting, but also some of the surprises and uh, the learning that came along. And after we unpack the case study, we'll delve more into what uh, what did we, uh, the kind of methodological overview of the rest of the studies and some of the key findings that can be highlighted uh, overall. And during this whole period, we are going to engage with you in a discussion. So uh, hopefully either online you can type or um, you can um, post um, an answer and the people that are in the room would be able to um, make it a two-way conversation. <laughs> so we'll start um, a little bit. Um, the piece, uh, For the case study, we distributed a pre-read. Um, I don't want to put people on the spot if you haven't read the pre-read, so we have prepared for both scenarios. But I'm hoping that uh, if you have read uh, the pre-read, you would be able to engage with us to answer this question. So the first question is, uh, from what you read, from uh, this case study uh, on the interpersonal psychotherapy groups. Um, what did you get or think was the general theory of change for the intervention? Okay. Uh, Bridget, do we have any one brave on life? Well, in fact, I gave them a pass online because I said uh, it was difficult to type in the chat. But if anybody online wants to uh, unmute yourselves and answer what might be a theory of change, please speak. Okay, we can um, move to the next next slide, and I'll help you out to go over the uh, what the theory of change uh, was a little bit. So when we looked at this group. Um, uh, this group had as, a, as an overall goal or as the impact level, they were trying to, um, they were formed to elevate the depression and dysfunction, uh, developing a way that was culturally appropriate uh, to, um, to address the, uh, the depression that was happening in Uganda around 2003, 2004, um, where uh, HIV AIDS were, uh, was still quite high. And there were a lot of people that either had HIV that were going through uh, um, depression or showing depression-like symptoms, or they had family members that were, uh, were sick or deceased, and they were, again, going, there was a lot of mental issues going um, in the community, but uh, there were taboo issues. 
So this intervention was about how to um, identify, but also at the end of the day, it, it was not a matter of identifying people that had the mental issues, but what, what culturally can you do to alleviate some of um, those depression-like uh, symptoms. Um, at the outcome le um, level, the program was aiming at reduced depression-like characteristics within the sample, within the, uh, the people that we were targeting, and uh, reduced severity scores uh, when it came to, again, depression and uh, uh, dysfunction. Um, at the output and activity level, we were looking at, um, uh, you. the program was delivering this 90-minute session for 16 weeks um, in a row, um, and it had about uh, 248 attendees. Um, and uh, the model was developed by uh, John Hopkins University um, as, an, as, as a way to try to help world vision uh, that was working in this area. So it was a model de developed by a university uh, and delivered through world vision, while the university was also testing the model, how it works. Uh, there was randomized control trials uh, going on at the same time, trying to prove uh, whether the, the model was working or, or not. Um, as the, when we are looking at the output uh, type of um, uh, achievements or what we what the program wanted to achieve was looking at um, training local people to be capable of leading group um, sessions, uh, psychotherapy sessions. So it's taking local people um, uh, that have no health background, um, do not know much about group facilitation, and bringing them up to speed and uh, making them capable uh, leaders in their communities. Then the second was uh, forming these groups that pretty much functioned like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous kind of groups, because they had to have a lot of confidentiality and the group uh, learning to open up because they were dealing uh, with issues of both bringing up issues of depression, um, uh, what were uh, some of the consequences that were going on in their lives, and then coming up with uh, group solutions, group support that would uh, enable the uh, people to, uh, I'll use the slang, snap out of it, but uh, that's not the right uh, uh, terminology. So um, these groups were meant to last, uh, the intervention was meant to last 16 weeks. At the end of the 16 weeks, they were meant to have gone through all the uh, training, session, training sessions that should it give some results. They were not meant to be a group that lasts forever. So at the end of the, um, set, uh, the 16 weeks, they were given the choice to remain as a group, um, dismantle, or rebrand uh, the group. So um, at the end, um, some of the groups chose to remain purely psycho uh, social therapy groups, continue their way, some uh, dissolved, and a number of them would receive income generation activities and uh, kind of either continue with a dual purpose where they could help, uh, they would continue, uh, continue, continue as a group but have some income generation going on. So at the output level, we're looking for the tra uh, training pers uh, train personnel, number of groups formed, number of uh, sessions um, delivered, number of groups with income generation at the end, so, as you see, like the typical uh, type of metrics that we would use in, at output level. Um, when it comes to activities, they think, uh, what, what was delivered was World Vision staff training local facilitators, local facilitators recruiting participants with depression-like uh, symptoms, um, and then World Vision providing training materials and be on call for support for, support for the facilitators, but it was pretty much uh, um, a self-running group. Uh, once you get the, the, there wasn't a World Vision person, I mean, present in the sessions or uh, the groups ran by them uh, by themselves. Is it clear uh, on what the intervention was like? Uh, not clear to me. It, but first, World Vision uh, trained a group of people. Is that the group that came together, or those people went ahead and created other groups? World Vision would train the facilitators or a group of. Uh, people that could be facilitators. So World Vision was responsible for uh, recruiting the seeds, uh, let's, call, let's call it that way, train them, and then these people would knock on doors. They had a screening, uh, almost like a screening kind of tool that would help them identify who 
would have this kind of system, uh, symptoms and see if they could would be interested in you know groups. We have two more questions from the room. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I just have a follow up question yes. on that. I saw the 16 weeks is well vision training or the training? no the training uh, the, uh, it's um, the facilitators delivering the package to the 16 to uh, it's of 16 weeks. It's not so talking about training the facilitators. Yeah. It's about the tra the training that <laughs> participants with uh, depression like system uh, symptoms receive. How long did well vision training last? Um, I think it was about three weeks at the time, yeah. How did World Vision select the local facilitators? Right. Using the same uh, methods that the facilitators would use for uh, uh, recruiting the, uh, the participants. So in a similar fashion, World Vision, um, all of uh, this program, especially in Rakai, we had been there for a number of years. So we had been there, um, I would say, early 90s. So for uh, almost a decade uh, running programs. So, uh, and each of the villages had groups that are called village development facilitators so that they know the community well. So at first it was uh, in a similar fashion trying to figure out who would be interested in this, um, in this program, show some of the uh, symptoms and choosing like uh, a core group. And then that core group would replicate that. But um, they would be again like, uh, try to be anonymous. So you don't have necessarily this people. And there was a question here. So I have a question about the, the, the outcomes. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of right. lead on to questions about you know, yeah. measuring and so on. But uh, so I don't have to, to ask or answer it, but let me just pose it. And the so what essentially what are the outcomes, right? Because it seems that right. one level of outcomes is, is uh, <coughs> whether people are trained and you know and whether they've mm -hmm. learned uh, the tra whatever from the training. And another outcome is that at a, at a higher level is uh, how many groups are formed mm -hmm. and, and, and how many people attend regularly. And then lastly, the, the, the higher level is uh, depression symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so the question so is... So my question is, is, am I seeing this right? I guess uh, yes. <laughs> yes, there are outcome, uh, outputs and outcomes that um, or results maybe let's call them results because we may have different language of how we define each of them. Results that go in a chain from the most uh, basic one, which would be um, that you have personnel, facilitators that have completed the course and are cert uh, certified to start this course. Then you would have the number of groups that were actually uh, formed, um, and then you would have the participants' uh, attendance that, uh, that you would look that went through all the 16 um, uh, weeks um, of, of training, but ultimately going through 16 weeks or not was not uh, what we wanted to get. What we wanted to get is, um, are they displaying less depression and less uh, um, at the end of the, um, of the 16 weeks than they had at, at the start of it? Uh, the two papers that are attached uh, in the pre-read that uh, are actually uh, externally published by John Hopkins, ex exactly on how the, the model runs, what they intended with the model to, be, to do, and uh, what were the specific outcomes that they were looking for. Uh, at that stage, when we, uh, when we talk about the theory of change, it's how was the intervention intended to work. So uh, there is a lot more um, details of the model that, uh, um, we can unpack from looking at um, at the initial study. Can we take uh, one or two questions? Uh, like, Bridget, uh, is there anything that is going online? And we have two people in the room that have questions, and then we will have to wrap up to the next one. Yeah, there's a question online about the role of the income generating activities in the theory of change. Uh, the question is, uh, was the theory that both psychosocial intervention and economic intervention is needed to reduce depression, or that it could be either or? Okay, that's a, a very, very good uh, question. Um, like, why did these groups, uh, why was the income generation even offer, offered or like uh, became part of uh, the options at the end? Um, the options um, that were given to the group at the end, it's, it, uh, it was more uh, depending on what the group had discussed if a lot of the pressure and uh, the depression was um, related to economic uh, situations uh, and the group uh, had, um, had discussed that 
something like uh, their group would be interested in uh, some kind of, uh, and we're using income generation as a big, um, big term. It, it didn't necessarily mean sometimes it would be to be the group themselves. It was almost like a uh, what is called merry-go-round. So everyone puts a little bit of money. Uh, they have a pot of money as a group, and then they go and uh, uh, each one in the group uh, participates, almost like a savings group, but in a rudimentary form, not necessarily with books and um, uh, the, the the treasure. It, um, it was coming more as a group of friends um, or a group of uh, that by the time had bonded well, that could get to that agreement. Um, however, when World, uh, World Vision uh, looked at some of these groups, if the groups would struggle or um, look like uh, World Vision could help, because we were helping other groups, providing income generation activities, um, then these groups, uh, we would offer the same to these groups. The, what World Vision offered, and we'll talk a little bit um, later on, would be things like, um, uh, livestock for the group um, members or um, tents and chairs uh, so that they could rent them out. Um, so that's the, where did it come from? It came from the, the group's perspective and analysis of what, um, where, what were the causes of their depression and how if as a group they had something, what could that look like? But the group had, had, had to come up with that plan and there wasn't necessarily um, uh, a World Vision promise that the groups would get help from World Vision. Some of that had to be internally, internal mechanisms of funding this uh, generating activities, um, income generating activities. And Bridget, you can add more online on, uh, on the groups. We'll take the two questions that we had here, and we have to move beyond the theory of change because we want to learn about sustainability. And what were the challenges of actually measuring the same ones? Yes. I was just wondering if the groups were <coughs> different for people who were living with HIV and people who had friends or family members who had HIV. We don't know that. We do not know. Um, uh, we know the screening, um, the screening tool, and the screening tool did not discriminate between and forming uh, groups for those that had HIV versus those that uh, were um, had uh, a parent, a child, a relative. They were groups were formed based on the depression-like system, uh, symptoms that they demonstrated, not necessarily um, where they were coming from. And uh, one um, little detail that you'll find in the um, in the paper. Uh, in the first paper that was uh, published in 2006, um, you'll learn that the groups were uh, primarily um, desegregated by sex. So you had men's and uh, women's groups. That was the only um, division, desegregated by sex. They all had the rest of the characteristics. Um, there wasn't like a, a division of the groups. Yeah, and you had a question? Yeah, so I I've seen in that pre-read that um, it's, they weren't sure how many of the groups were formed originally. Um, and so I was just curious, as we're talking about the theory of change, what was sort of the scale of the project? Um, even if they don't know the number of groups formed, did they know the number of you know, facilitators that were trained? Sort of what was the right. scale? Uh, for the two, uh, when they were formed in the uh, year 2000, uh, uh, the period 2004, um, 2006, when John Hopkins were, was running, um, the uh, the model and World Vision was more there, like looking how the model would turn out. We only know that there were 248 attendees uh, in general, um, and the groups were about like uh, not more uh, than uh, 10, 15. So, and that was the the group members, not just the facilitators. Uh, it would be uh, one group member could uh, one facilitator could facilitate more than one group mm -hmm. if they were. They were volunteers. So if they could handle more than one group, they could have two groups. Um, but uh, normally, they would run with one group. Do, yes? Do the facilitators and the group members have the same uh, uh, depression-like -like symptoms? In the beginning, yes. That's why, um, uh, but the, what the facilitators had was the, this, um, they wanted to do something. Like that's uh, the the desire to uh, to engage and uh, run a, a group. 
So their symptoms were necessarily um, uh, like being helped. They were um, at the point of like we want to uh, to help. I am not sure. I know that this tool uh, that was used for recruitment existed. I haven't actually seen the tool to be able to answer your questions with. Um, yeah, it's just because you yeah. said for uh, World Vision and the facilitators, they sh use the same model to recruit. Like, so, I just thought. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so, yeah, so I can we pass, uh, Bridget, any other comment before we pass to the next nope. question? Nope, no other okay. question. Okay, so we'll go back. Um, and we'll go with what you heard. This is a case study. So um, this is now when we move theoretically. If this was done at your organization, uh, what would you say, how would you define uh, sustainment in the context of, um, of um, this intervention? Yeah, uh, what would you say, like, what, what did you expect to be sustained out of this intervention? Take a shot. Yeah, yeah you did give yourself some easy ones and some hard ones. The easy ones would be like, are the groups still meeting regularly? Uh -huh. And then the harder ones would be like, if we gave them a simple test on, you know, depression, like the symptoms, are they, you know, better off? That mm -hmm. would be kind of a sustainment long-term outcome. And this, we're measuring this uh, sustainment characteristics a few years after the intervention clo um, closed, right? right? We did the 16 weeks. That's what we were responsible for. Um, we handed it off, and then we go how many years after? I don't know, three, four. Three, four years after we go and we want to check whether the groups are still existing and if we gave them a test on depression, how are they doing? Okay. I would be interested more at the outcome level uh -huh. where you were mentioning about the decline in the uh, depression. So not necessarily whether groups exist or not exist, it doesn't matter to me, but they got the training or uh, whether that, that norm or the thing that Mm -hmm. Community at large is able to deal with. So I would be interested more on that. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, someone else who uh, not necessarily look at the groups, but would we'll look at whoever ever participated in the group and graduated. If we could do a follow up, whether they are still in a group or not in a group, um, what are their um, depression like uh, symptoms? Okay. We'll take one more person here, and then uh, we'll go online and figure out what are, what's the discussion going on there. I think it would also be look, interesting to look at um, is there a difference between the people, between um, depressive symptoms, between people who are still participating in the groups and people who are not, but then complete the training. Okay, that's a good, interesting uh, take on it. So basically, we go three, four years after, we look at those people that remained in the groups, what are their symptoms, and then we go and look at those that participated in groups. They are no longer in groups. Um, we do not, um, they finished some, I don't know how many years before. We look at their uh, depression symptoms. Okay. Sorry, this is a clarifying question. I thought you said you didn't know who the group members were. You, uh, you forget about that. Now, this okay. is your case study. Because <laughs> that would be a challenge that would change the way I would design it. If I knew up front <clears throat> that, that I didn't know who participated in groups, then I would be looking at community level uh -huh. uh, measures instead and asking community members to what extent they would say people were depressed, mm -hmm. um, to what extent they thought people were coping well with AIDS and loss and others. Okay. Um, Sure, we'll take one more question. Really yeah. quick, it would be interesting to know too if there was any like scaling up of it after you left. Did those facilitators go off, or people within the groups become facilitators, start their right. own group somewhere else, maybe even if they move to other communities or something? Yeah, that would be a, a very interesting take to see. Like, uh, since the uh, the facilitators could form more than one group, if uh, they continue to, um, maybe if a group uh, terminated, if they started a new one, or maybe. Uh, they kept the old ones, but they also started a new one. Okay, Bridget, do you have any um, updates? I, I'm not looking at the chat, so. Um. Oh, we, we only had one comment online, and it was about the measurement of the level of depression. Um, but I have a question for everybody, and, and it reverts back to this discussion of what the groups are doing. 
would would we say that the groups had been sustained would we want to see them doing the exact same activities as we left them with or is it okay that they evolve did you uh, get Bridget's question? If for the groups that were there, uh, that we find out there, what would our expectation be? That they would be doing the same thing or that they had evolved or changed? I think yeah. they evolved. Evolved. And that's, that's one common question, I think, building on all of the comments here uh, that I have. I mean, yes, ultimately we want to know, is there a reduction in the level of these depressive symptoms in the community? Uh -huh. But uh, if, I mean, if we can't answer that question, or if the answer is no, I think I would be interested in knowing is, are these, are the types of activities that are conversations or levels of support that was happening through the group, is that now happening in an increased way in the community through whatever format, right? Did they adopt the technique yeah. and the, the communication and the yeah. support and, and sort of transition it to fit their own community needs, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or within a household or right. on a community level. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, just building on that. But I think uh, the core objective or goal of the study would be try to reduce the number of uh, the, the fresh, or, or the symptoms in the community or in the groups. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't happen, as we said, then maybe the study would have like, you know, we would say, yeah, so he fell, or maybe uh -huh. redesign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so in, to respond to her, her question, is like, it really depends on what you want uh, the, the design to show. But at the end of the day, what you want is to decrease uh, depression. Yeah. Okay, we have one comment, one comment, two comments. Just, you said they were RCTs, not a genetic mm -hmm. like this. So, because the issue here that that sort of underlying is what is the counterfactual? Right. Okay. Um, the people. The again. Uh, please go afterwards. Just out of curiosity, we had so much discussion about this. Uh, check the 2006 paper because it will give you some of the uh, content. But from the RCTs um, uh, from, that were conducted, you will see that the focus of the model was on uh, the people participating, and uh, uh, they were compared. To, uh, to people that did not participate but chose to, uh, that were participating in other types of uh, kinds of groups like churches, um, like church groups, or um, not affiliated to churches, but um, um, and actually not affiliated to anything. And the, uh, the, we were compared, um, the study compared uh, the depression um, levels. Um, across this kinds of participants. If you participated in uh, this type of group, which was uh, culturally appropriate to build anonymous, uh, small um, t uh, time frame fixed versus a group that was more loose, uh, maybe had some same characteristics. I don't know how church groups run. Maybe they still have the same kind of uh, discussions, but something that was um, different versus some people that maybe never went to a group. So you can check um, on that out, but that's where they came out with uh, the statement definition that um, the result, the end result was that, wow, um, one, the scores were better uh, in the study for those that were uh, part of the groups, which is why World Vision was interested in the model. Uh, two, um, not only they were, um, uh, they, they, the depression scores went down, but actually um, the groups stayed, um, many of the groups decided to stay together after uh, the 16 weeks. So those were the two, but they were only measured six months after the group had completed. So, for all, so what I'm saying is that <coughs> and to know whether the decrease or increase mm -hmm. of, of, of the rate of symptoms uh, is, is due to the program, to the project, mm -hmm. you need a common factual mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Bridget, uh, any comment on that? Yeah, there's another, well, there's another question online, but it, um, I actually think it, it's a good question to prompt us to move forward. And it, it is, um, that since these are ex post evaluations, a lot of these outcome measurement examples seem to imply pre and post assessments. And so how, how did we deal with this issue? And I, you know, we're, gonna, we're about to get to that. So I think we can probably go ahead and move forward for how we define sustainment and our benchmarks, and then we can talk about it. Okay. 
So we're moving to um, to pass this defining statement about this. So um, for this, we were um, the defining of the statement about this uh, from these groups were maintain whether the groups uh, were still there. They are maintaining uh, the uh, maintain the activities of IPTG post program included but not limited to counseling and to, uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, so uh, and then uh, maintain or expand the activities of the of the groups post program. A little bit of uh, uh, what one of the participants here was also looking at. Uh, maintain or improve about the uh, the reduction of depression in the participant population. We are not necessarily looking outside of the the groups. So we're again focused honing on the uh, on the um, can we pass to the next slide? Okay. But then it came the point of like what what are we measuring? These are the kinds of things we wanna see. Um so the groups are sustained, they still have like a um a counseling component into them that they are maintaining, um and that uh, the the benefits of um um uh, of reduction in uh, depression symptoms are still continuing among uh, participants. But what are we measuring it again? So here we are looking at, these are again uh, examples, because we'll tell you later about this, but we are looking like, because who can tell us uh, right now if I tell you 50% of the groups uh, is the benchmark that we are measuring again, if the benchmarks were not set, like, is it good or bad? Like I'm saying, 50% of the IPTGs remain at program closure. Uh, they are still active two years after the program closure. That could be one benchmark. You could you could build several of these benchmarks, right? There is no thing in the room that one. Sorry, you just set the numbers of whatever you want them to be. What just we have some about someone ambitious in the room. They want to set up numbers higher. They want more percent of a higher percentage of groups to be. Uh, still existing yeah. here doctor. That's good. Okay. Yes. I think it also would be important to know how many of the groups that were started originally, how many of them actually chose to continue even uh -huh. at the end of the program. Because they okay. said that they gave them the choice to continue right. or not. Or not. Uh -huh. So that would be very interesting. Okay. Even for short term sustainability. And would you have a benchmark uh, or you would have it just open, like you're just exploring at this point, saying, um, how many, and then whatever the figures come, what are you benchmarking it against? Yeah, I think you'd want to have a target. I, I would say, you know, you'd probably want it to be more than 50% in that case, just because your program has been supported throughout, but I think it would depend on, on the program itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we want to set some benchmark we're seeing. Um, we don't necessarily have like a, what are we setting them against? We just have some idea we want them higher than 50% to be existing or something, but we are all like right now just passing numbers up. Yes? Um, sorry. So, I mean, you can definitely just for, you know, informational sake to see what groups are after, you know, are there six months, two years after, but it seems that it would be more important to actually know, yes, depression levels and such, but getting back to those activities and what those people are doing, because maybe after 16 weeks, the group doesn't need to have the same original um, group or meeting that it was having, and actually changing to another group might be the, you know, the right direction for those people and such. And so, I don't know, having a benchmark of that, we should have, you know, three or 50 percent of those groups as initially created mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be as meaningful, because that might not actually be the best thing for those people. Maybe those people should have moved on to something else and that would have actually been a, a, you know, decreased their depression even more through community activities and work and whatnot. Excellent. I don't know. Just yeah, to... no, that's an excellent comment and it gets us back to the discussion of like, um, how do we define sustainment for this group? Because there was a way of defining it by the number, but then it's the thing of like, like is, would that be the right thing? Or maybe moving on would have been the best thing. Uh, yes, please. The definition of sustainability depends on, it goes back to your theory of change a little bit, because mm -hmm. is your theory of change that this is, that this is it, actually, right? That is it. Or is your theory of change about sort of capacity building to see this expand? Mm -hmm. And if your theory of change is about capacity building and seeing this expand and local ownership and all this, 
Okay. You want more than 50%, you want 200%. Okay. So. There is, um, and these are great concepts, and I these are the same things that we wrestled with uh, from different angles. Some of us would be more, I'm sorry, I'm going to call you the Puritan, but I'm, I don't mean it in a bad way, but more like we have a theory of change, we're sticking uh, to it based on a theory of change, what we, uh, is reasonably to expect. Then we had the, uh, another bunch of us looking more of like, well, um, what is beyond the theory of change when we talk about the same in you know, a bigger way and we're exploring, what could be other things that are sustained that we, our theory of change, did not account for, uh, did not think of? Um, maybe um, not everything needs to be sustained. <coughs> if we drop some of those things, what are the new things that uh, we, can, we, have, we, we should uncover um, that were sustained and we never thought of? True, but you could have thought about it at, at the point. And you could have thought about it, sure. Um, Two more comments here and one online, and we'll have to move to the next one. Yes. So, are you using your benchmarks as your point of the evaluation? Because part of me thinks that all of evaluations of sustainability of any program are more appreciative inquiry about what is it or how are these being sustained rather than did we meet some random arbitrary mm -hmm. number at the end? What, what were the dynamics of, of how sustainment happened, and so when we do our expos and what we when we talk about what we're going to do, it, it ends up being appreciative inquiry in a lot of places rather than setting a, a benchmark, which is what our principal donor likes to talk about sustainability benchmarks, and we like to really push right. back and say, uh -huh. let's not put numbers on these. Let's talk about what kinds of things you want sustained, and then we'll tell you how we sustain them. That's a yes. I mean, this is um, your example now. We gave you the case study and like what, how we would, um, uh, we want to figure out like how you would have defined sustainability and what kind of things you would have looked. And that is definitely a, another approach of taking it, an exploratory approach of, um, we do not know what the benchmarks for this type of intervention would, uh, would be. But then let's figure out more uh, open-minded, um, which would be reflected in the kinds of methods we choose on figuring out what has been sustained and why and what does it tell us about our programs. Okay, can I take uh, one or two questions online just to make sure that, um, or comments online? Yeah, so um, there was a comment about uh, whether we uh, looked at expect, uh, unexpected and emerging outcomes mm -hmm. and impacts. Mm -hmm. There's a comment about social impacts. Um, being difficult to measure, but but probably important to measure. A comment about um, measuring the percentage of people who remain in the groups that continue, um, uh, assuming that there are probably some dropouts within the group. And actually, there's a really good question here about how did we set the target benchmark? And I have a question back, and it's kind of a rhetorical question as we move along. Um, and the question is, uh, when, when you set the target benchmarks? Um, uh, probably just as important as how, how do you set them. And, and Holta, just to do a time check, we have about 35 minutes left. Ooh, okay. We'll, uh, we'll go speed up a little bit with the case study and let, uh, leave less uh, questions for how you would have imagined and tell you what we did. So, okay. Um, okay, so let's go with uh, the challenges that we encountered. So most of these programs, um, uh, that uh, that we run. If we go back to uh, remember what, uh, what when was this program closed? The this uh, bigger program under which this intervention um, belongs. It was closed in 2010. So when it was closed in 2010, no one back then was thinking of sustainability in the same way that we think uh, seven or eight years uh, later as we're debating as a community. So the program did not expect that anyone would go back and check and be like, they left some ideas of sustainability, so now we are coming with this new thinking and wrestling as a community and trying to go back and figure out well, what's the scene? And there were all these questions that we wished we had in place to answer those questions. So these are our challenges. We had an unknown number uh, um, of groups to, uh, to track. Uh, all that we were told with is when the program closed, uh, there were 23 groups uh, operating in that area. 
we do not know how many groups had existed from the time that um, the intervention started in 2004, but maybe close um, or decided not to continue uh, by the time that 2010 happened. So we don't know that number of uh, the groups that um, existed out there. All we know is 23 of them were left uh, at program closure. Uh, because of the nature of the, of the groups, there is no participants to, <laughs> to track. Uh, so imagine you've got an area of 40,000, 50,000 uh, people that live in an area. You know that there are supposed to be 23 groups left. You have no idea where they are, and you don't know who the participants in those groups are. That's what this first point means. Second was, um, again, I the limited record for known groups. Not the same on definition or preset benchmarks of success post closure for the groups or the participants. So there are all of the discussions that we had right now. 50% should be 90%. No, there should be no target. Um, it, that's where we started. It's like there is not, no description <laughs> of what uh, we all know that 23 were existing. We know that the model works. We know that um, John Hopkins says that if uh, six months after uh, the 16 weeks of training, uh, groups performed really well and stayed, uh, mostly stayed, uh, continues with their activities. That's all we know. And that was from 2006 kind of study. Um, transition or exit strategies uh, implemented for the overall program, the, the, um, not only this intervention, but overall when the program was closing, happened very close at the end of the program. Uh, so um, it was like, okay, chop chop, it's 2008, we're revving up shop in 2010. So you had two years of uh, this exit strategy of coming up, so a lot of the assumptions on the uh, what the groups should sustain and how were not necessarily tested. We're like theories that people thought this would be sustained, put it in the exit strategy, and we closed shop in Rakai. Next one. What methodology then how we would go from what methodology to come up with to study these groups. So lucky for this group, um, maybe because the model was uh, to the heart of many people at Johns Hopkins, and maybe because the professor at Columbia University uh, happened to mentor someone, there was someone that did a PhD uh, dissertation on this particular group um, in 2010, right as the program was wrapping up. Um, and he only published his dissertation, I guess, in 2016. But we had, uh, we were able to track the, this researcher and figure out what did he look at the groups and what kind of methodology uh, did he look in 2010 so that we could see if we could replicate. And essentially, the method that we ended up using is a replication of his method. So essentially, uh, using pre-listing approach, uh, we did interviews with 29 um, members of the seven groups that we were able to track out of the 23. Um, and we did five, uh, five in-depth interviews with, um, uh, with the um, uh, seven facilitators. So we had seven inter, uh, groups. Each one had a facilitator. We were able to interview five of those. Uh, we were able to interview from all seven groups, 29 people. And then um, he did something that we also replicated, where he asked both the facilitator and the, uh, uh, the group members if they could give us referrals of people that um, knew about the effects of their group. And those people could be um, members of their families, could be village elders, could be a school teacher, could be a health person, could be a business person, whoever they thought that could be a good referral. So that those. This is our, the people that we track. Seven groups that we could find, 29 members, five facilitators, and 12 referrals. Next one. What did we find? Well, um, the fact is we went four, in this, in this group, we went four and a half years uh, later um, than 2010. Even if the groups had started in 2010, that's way longer uh, to exist. Um, the seven groups than um, what the model was thinking of. However, what we know um, is that four of the groups had been operational at the time when we measured over a decade. 
Uh, and three of them appear to have been formed towards the last two years of the program. Uh, so basically, it's around 2010, uh, 2008. Um, what, we what we learned from the groups is that the groups evolved in terms of membership, who were their members, and in terms of group size. Uh, what did, does that mean in terms of membership? Uh, the groups remained the core of the people that uh, were before. However, they also introduced a membership fee to, because, uh, I guess, survival of the group. And the membership fee was either uh, an annual fee of $1 or was a one life, a once, um, once uh, you know, what do we call it, one lifetime subscription uh, of $37. Uh, so there was a mixture of membership, but this was not something that existed before. It was something that was new. Um, they were open uh, to recruit new people that were like them, but there wasn't necessarily like a screening process for the depression like um, method. Uh, method. There were just group rules that they had established that if you were a new member, you could join, but the rules were more around uh, anonymity of uh, what you discuss in the group related to the group, otherwise the group kicks you out. There were uh, they're a little bit different than just looking at those depression like uh, kind of uh, new recruitment. Uh, Sorry, the, uh, what the groups had decided. All groups continue to provide uh, social psych, uh, psychosocial services to their members on a case by case basis. Now, not as like training sessions, but if someone goes through something, there will um, the group would uh, uh, gather around that person and provide that kind of social uh, psychosocial um, support. Um, techniques we measure the kind of same kind of, uh, uh, whether they were using the same type, kind of techniques and looked at back at the manual that they used to have and see with, uh, whether it was the same. The techniques had kind of become more general in their maybe lack of refresher courses or maybe for some reason they had evolved. They were, they were more general than the precise kind of uh, questions that you would ask uh, when they were doing the training curricula. The core activities of the groups, for all groups, um, they currently revolve around income generation and supporting each other in agriculture activities. So the, there were two, um, the income generation came in two, or the, uh, the economic component had two parts. One, everyone, it, um, all the groups mentioned the things that um, they would help each other go to and work the land. Uh, everyone in the group would go and work the land of one person. If there was a house to be built from one of the members, everyone participated and helped that way. So there was that kind of uh, help and support, which has an economic value, but not necessarily income generation. And then there were uh, these other components where people still had the tents and the chairs that were provided, and they were still doing drama. Uh, one group acted as a drama. Uh, facilitators, so they were hired by NGOs to go and perform hygiene, um, message, drama messages, HIV or nutrition. That's how they are generated income. Can I hold the questions for the end? Sorry, so that we can go through. Yes. Uh, one of the uh, things that we asked, similar to what the uh, model had, is um, what was the self-perception uh, self of the group in terms of effectiveness? How did they feel about their, uh, their group effectiveness? Uh, they were supposed to generate just uh, statements. 255 change statements were generated. Three uh, from the um, list, uh, free listing, only eight were negative. Um, the most impactful areas mentioned across, like frequent, we're talking frequency here, was in, uh, they found that the group, uh, the group improved economic situation. The group improved, uh, um, they could see, they linked their group participation to uh, improvement in child education either the, ab uh, the ability or the parental involvement, uh, increased group cohesion, and these three uh, top out of the five that you see on the screen were the same things that the um, Columbia University PhD student uh, found in his 2010 study of these 23 groups, out of which seven were the ones that we, uh, that we tracked. To wrap up uh, our case study, I'll leave this question with you so that I can, we have an opportunity to uh, uh, actually see the, the overall uh, findings rather than just one honing on one question, uh, one uh, key study. Think about this. If this was your um, 
your situation, this was your group, your organization had invested in it. What learnings would you, high, uh, would you highlight for your internal audiences? If, and then what learning would you highlight for your external audiences? Um, and then what implications would you consider in the messaging? I'll pause it to that. Yes, okay, sorry, I have, there are two uh, comments here that we'll take, and Bridget, I'll offer one to the people online, and then we can move to the next. Just really quick, just to clarify, the one outcome about the groups only giving psychosocial services on a case-by-case -case basis, was that because there were not very many people that actually needed that anymore, or was it that the groups just totally shifted and didn't want to do a whole full thing? Um, I would like, I, okay, I was on the ground for this, so I'd like, um, my perception was uh, from reading the, the transcripts and the, um, the dynamics of how they had answered, that the groups, um, the members had been there together for so long that they didn't do the same training over and over. So after, um, the 2010 or whenever they finish the 16 weeks, uh, then the the kind of support that they will get from the group would be if the uh, if someone left and the group not left, then everyone joined um, like around uh, that group, or if a new person that had joined uh, showed some of those um, um, symptoms. And it was a lot uh, when we talk about symptoms, it's things that happen in their life. If you uh, if we read the report, it would be things like uh, if someone um, if there is a death in the family, uh, then the group immediately that was the case by case. Then the group immediately would um, would offer the uh, the advice and the kind of support uh, and try to lift the person up uh, that was going through the difficulty. So that was the case by case uh, as it happened. Uh, and there was comment here. Yes. Yeah, so I'm I was trying to relate. Uh, thank you very much for this case study. I'm trying to relate it with something similar that we are doing in Uganda. So that is more with the treatment of depression during pregnancy. So mm -hmm. understanding that if you treat uh, depression, uh, basically deal with uh, mother who are depressed while pregnancy, it reduces stunting. So that sort of relationship. And these uh, interventions are also similar, forming this groups, but in this case, Catholic groups. So I was very excited about the uh, positive self-perception about the group effectiveness mm -hmm. about, because we are treating them in, it's a randomized control trial, again, the University of Columbia University, uh, two contexts where you don't provide, you just provide some counseling, but not the uh, therapy, where the other game, you provide counseling and therapy and see whether that makes a difference. So, how does the group work in that context? Yes. I think that's something I have. Thanks for that example. <coughs> I'm sure that similar studies are happening all the time, and um, these are the things that we all look. Bridget, any quick comments on that uh, side before we pass to Whitney? There's a good question online about whether it would be possible to compare the outcomes for the IPT groups to similar benchmarks for um, specifically income generation uh, groups. Given that the IPT groups evolved into mostly economic groups, um, this, this individual said it'd be interesting to know the value added of the psychosocial component, which I think is a really good question. And you know, the, the limiting factor for us was that um, this is one intervention in one site, and we these were sites that were multi-sectoral. They had many different types of interventions. We had a very limited budget. And this is a good question and point to lead us into um, Whitney's um, presentation now. Because Whitney is going to tell you about the broad methodology across the nine sites as well as findings across the nine sites. Um, while Whitney uh, is preparing for that and starting, for those of you in the room, I'll pass a, a sheet where you can uh, also leave us the question. Uh, with the promise, I have been in a lot of uh, WebExes and presentations that people don't get back to you. Um, we are really interested in getting back to you and trying to form uh, a community that talks about this. So if you have a question or a learning that you want us uh, to get back to you, write it there and uh, with a promise, um, and you'll see me at interaction a lot, so I better keep my promise, <laughs> besides going to maternity leave for the next month. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, this is an excellent discussion.
discussion. And we're about to zoom out um, much, much higher level. And we're going to skim kind of briefly because we're still going to try to leave at least a few minutes at the end to um, ask some questions. Um, but all, all of those questions that we just discussed in the case study around sort of benchmarking and how we should treat evolution, is that is that a cop-out because we deviated from the theory of change, or is that, in fact, what we should have been looking for all along? Um, these are things to keep in mind as I skim very, very broadly, um, kind of going all the way back. So if you recall Bridget's chart, she showed you those 980Ps. In the first round of ex post evaluations we did, um, we were looking at three sites. Um, further um, apart and distant since closure. And it, it was part of a stream of other research efforts that I would say was really quite ambitious. And we, we were driven to go out and study some really core aspects of our world vision identity. And so you can see those domains listed here, child focus, community empowering, long-term presence and Christian, and the ways that those have kind of shaped the research questions. And we'll share the slides so you guys can read the details there, but I'm going to move quickly because I think you'll get the gist of what we're trying to talk about here. And as you may also remember from the beginning, when Bridget described, these are area development programs, which for us means that they're all funded via child sponsorship, but that also means that the participants in these programs are experiencing a multi-sectoral intervention, so health, education, wash, food security, um, over a long period of time. So those, those programs are evolving. So multi-sectoral, different types of activity, in addition to the things that are unique to participating as a child who is sponsored. So the, the regular monitoring visits, exchanges and interactions with a sponsor who lives abroad and so on. So when we first came to these um, first round of ex post, we were taking a, a very large scope. We wanted to see like what altogether is sustainable for both children and their families and communities. And so we are kind of looking at um, what is sustained and sort of for whom. And so the main domain, we were trying to look for, um, we were also trying to study things that were common across these three sites. So they had a lot of similarities in sort of the world vision approach. They would have also been hyper contextualized. Um, so we're looking for things that were um, aligned with the sectors that were most invested in, in those sites. But that also aligns with the overall world being, uh, world vision, child well-being aspirations. And then we do have um, what we call a compendium, a list of common indicators. And as much as possible, we would have worked those into our evaluations when they when they were appropriate. And then when we were trying to decide, you know, what is the appropriate population? As you can imagine, of course, we did have much better records about who participated and and where they are than we did in the IPTGs, but. Um, with multi-sector, many, many years, um, record keeping was a challenge. And so we had to make some strategic choices about who do we think is, is the most important target population to go back to and study at this point in time. And we made a decision that we wanted to um, study the sustainment among those who were uh, most likely to have been exposed to the core of the program. So for us, that in these first rounds, that meant um, individuals who had been sponsored as children, registered in the child sponsorship program, and then their families, because our, our model says we want children as individuals to be, you know, educated and in good health and taken care of, but we also want those families and their communities to be able to take care of kids. So we're looking at children and their families in this first round. Um, so here's a summary of the methods here. You see those three sites over a period of time. We first had to go back and sort of reconstruct program history. We did have documents over um, the whole period, but um, you can imagine those were spotty in places. Um, we did a quantitative survey among those former sponsored children and, and their caregivers who were then caring for children now. So, you know, the former sponsored child may now be 22, but his parents or her parents are also perhaps now caring for siblings. We want to look at the Sort of dual unit and see how they're doing together. And then we also observe the status of infrastructure, observe the status of groups remaining, um, part of which we just discussed, and did a number of um, qualitative interviews and group discussions to better understand the dynamics of how and why and, and what exactly is going on beyond the um, outcomes. So um, I will speak louder for people on the phone. And what we found, as you might imagine, was sort of 
Um, well, first of all, a great deal of information, uh, much, much more than we're getting into now. And that also um, led us into how we had to deal with and respond to the next round of ex post. But to summarize the mix of findings, we did find that former registered children in the Sri Lanka site um, were having noticeably higher levels of perceived well being at the time um, than when we saw the children in the sites in Kenya and Uganda. Um, when we look at groups, we saw that regardless of sort of which site and what their size was at the time we left, um, what we saw is that groups, many remained active, but almost all of them were evolving. And one of the most common features of that evolution was groups that were once designed to sort of maybe drive community development altogether were now often evolved to be more sort of member interest, generating benefits for the members. And then we also found at this time that the groups that were designed to, you know, hopefully be sort of more traditional uh, CBOs um, and the child groups, those were the ones that were largely unsuccessful after the departure, except for one example. So I'm going to keep on moving, but feel free to keep tracking with your questions. So in round two, like I said, in that first round, we had three sites that covered multiple sectors, multiple domains, dozens of groups, hundreds of uh, households and individuals, and a lot of data. And um, we had some challenges in, in the uptake organizationally and really making the best use of that learning. So when we wanted to do a second round of ex post, we wanted to kind of hone in and uh, make the best use of a second experience. So we um, focused in, in a few different ways. Um, one is that we went back to sites uh, much closer to the time of closure. So rather than waiting four years or five years, we went back a year and a half or two years after program closure. Uh, that helps us logistically in terms of better documents, better records, better access to former staff so that um, we were less impeded by the sheer logistics of the study and we could learn more. It also helped make sure that findings from those programs would be uh, more aligned with the current programming approaches that we're doing. When you have these very old programs, it's natural that as we're learning as an organization that things that we did 20 years ago, we're not doing anymore. So that's great that we've learned and kind of affirmed the changes that we've made, but what can we learn about the sustainability of the types of things that we're still doing? So those are some of the choices that we made about the types of programs that we selected and going back to them a little bit sooner um, their time of closure. And maybe the, the part of the outcomes um, um, in World Vision are related to this notion of the community groups will sustain the outcome. So if you go and measure the first piece of the puzzle, well, how are the groups uh, doing? then uh, you don't waste your money and uh, uh, going back and measuring outcomes when your your key theory is not holding. So uh, there, after this phase, then we could uh, take another phase approach where we looked at the outcomes for the groups um, that uh, were sustained, and then we would be able to connect the outcomes better with the type of theory that we had in mind. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you, Holden. So that's why you see at the bottom of the methods here, you're not seeing as much about surveys with individuals. We're looking at status of infrastructure, status of groups, and then digging into working with those groups about how and why they're working and their strongest and weakest capacities for continued sustainability. Um, and we use a tool called the um, PSI, the Program Sustainability Index for that. So you can jot that down if you want to learn more. Um, you can see here is the, some of the findings, the status of those. So we've got kind of a range uh, 40, only 43% of groups in our uh, group of cigar in India, but as high as almost, you know, 89-90% in uh, one of our Myanmar sites. And so that's a snapshot here. There's a lot we could say and a lot that we've learned from this, um, but I'm going to keep on moving because we're going to summarize. <laughs> uh, in addition to just seeing which group is <coughs> left, we, I said, use an index in addition to some of our qualitative work to determine what were some of the strongest capacities and what were some of the greatest challenges to those groups to continue on in their work. Um, and we found that um, these dimensions here, leadership competence and the sort of members involvement and integration um, were the strongest, whereas strategic funding was the greatest 
challenge. Um, we'd be happy to share more on what those actual dimensions and definitions mean as a follow-up. So I'm going to stop there and let Holter wrap up with the bringing that all together, round one and round two. Okay, these are more process findings, but these are the things that internally, um, you remember when I asked uh, the questions about IPDGs, what kind of, what things would you tell your internal organization? So this is the dirty laundry of what we told our organization in terms of processes. One um, is the, um, it's talking about transition plans. And doc, uh, what we found is that the documents typically presented the program achievement, what the program did, we did this, we did this, like long list of things that we did and how well that they were done, but often did not explain in detail how the achievements uh, would be sustained. And we figured out that, that the pressure was coming from us because we, uh, we were asking for justification for leaving uh, or closing, right? The justification in your transition plans while you are wrapping up. So um, people tend to, when if you, that's how you frame your transition and sustainability, you are gonna get the answers that you get in terms of these are the achievements, but not necessarily uh, a, a rich description of how they will be uh, sustained. The linkage between sustainability of the groups, sustainability activities, and subsequently the outcomes was not made. So even uh, if they described, uh, when they moved to describe uh, sustainability of the groups, they talked about the groups, they talked about these achievements and outcomes that they were leaving, but they were not making the connection of like, uh, you had a, a large organization that is pulling out funding. Uh, you are leaving us um, a group, a local group of um, local groups here to sustain outcomes. But how is that math working in terms of uh, how large the the, the groups are? Um, how many? Uh, how will they be able to generate uh, funding uh, and all of that? The links were not that strong. That's what we um, that was uh, what we found across the site, and it didn't matter which phase we went which was the, uh, the point uh, and what we wanted to raise the, the finger, that no longer we're talking about older programs, even the ones that just uh, are wrapping up, are making the same kind of, um, falling in the same pitfall. Uh, lastly, uh, there was a scant articulation of what program outcomes were, suspected, were expected to be sustained, among whom and how sustainability was, um, uh, was defined. That was the question that we were asking you before, like, What's the definition of sustainability? How will we measure? If the programs don't leave you something uh, behind, then all you are going to do with um, ex post evaluation is exploration, which is fine. But if that's what you want to do for the rest of the time, uh, or if we want to change and uh, maybe test some of our theories and see how they have evolved. Uh, last uh, one for me is uh, this question of when we present ex post findings, um, if the findings are all glowing, everyone comes and runs with it, and no one asks any questions about learning. If the findings are mixed, then you have the kind of questions of like, we don't do this anymore, uh, this report looks like bleak, are there any positive case studies that you can share? And yes, there are positive uh, things that have happened. I would count the IPDGs with the limited expectations that we had on what we could find, not knowing anything about them, I would, I would consider it a success uh, case or something that we can definitely unpack and, and look for. There were several more like those, but these things, uh, the, the positive things that are happening, that exploration side, are things that uh, made us pop up with more questions on how to make programs better. And they were uh, naturally context specific. They were particular to a group we did not have IPTGs in the other side. It happened in Uganda. I didn't see it in Kenya. Um, but we had savings groups that we have everywhere. Somehow in uh, India, that group, even though uh, overall community groups were only 43%, in India, uh, when it came to savings groups, they were in good health. We had, uh, um, World Vision has led 1,000 so, uh, 1,034 uh, savings groups at the village level, combined together in 40 uh, umbrella uh, groups. Two years later, you find that 30 of those umbrella groups, so you can imagine uh, that it's still um, in the hundreds of the savings groups that are still functioning. Yes, that's a great story, but it belongs to India. We can't necessarily um, extrapolate because that's not what we found everywhere. If we had, we would tell you. Uh, there were a lot more of the things that uh, were exploratory that were great. Um, but they were, again, case study, 
one niche they were more they are great to hear and people need to hear it because otherwise they will get depressed. But <laughs> uh, we, uh, we need to keep it um, a little bit uh, like we need to share a little bit of both, both of the learning and the positive experiences. And we have managed, I think, with six minutes left to pass to the next. Okay. We do not have much opportunity to learn from you because uh, we took a lot more time on unpacking the, uh, the IPTs. Uh, but we would love to truly learn from what other organizations are doing, how they are defining sustainability, um, issues with methods or designs, and so on. So there is a, a, a sheet that we gave you. So if you can help us learn uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, um, how we can contact you, uh, what was the question or something you learned from today, that, um, and if you have any recommendations, this one we can open as a question for all. What can we do as a community to advance learning when it comes to sustainability um, and actual statement of outcomes? So uh, definitely write this out, but if there is someone that wants to uh, make comments, whether uh, online or here, this is the time as we wrap up. Yes, please. So the thing that I saw the challenge in my previous organization was funding. So excuse me, leadership was not didn't have a bunch of undesignated funds to do this kind of thing, and it wasn't built in program design. Most because a lot of the programs were donor funded. The donors gave very clear limitations on the funding periods from this date to this date. All expenses occurred after this date. You know, are not eligible. So how did you get funding for this? Like, could you share a little bit about the, the process? And you said your budget was really limited, and it seemed like you had a team of a certain number of people over a certain number of times. The three. The three of you? Okay. The three people that you have here. <laughs> um, I can definitely share uh, even, like, a, um, for the cost, uh, I can give you ranges. Um, the three bigger studies that were outcome-led uh, and so on were about, were about $50,000, $45,000. Fifty thousand dollars. They were uh, they, the expenses uh, were heavy because of the um, the quantitative survey. Uh, for the second round, once you remove that, uh, we're talking about um, seventeen thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars even, um, excluding that salary. This is, is excluding the three of us, right? And how much uh, time and effort, records writing, and yeah. other things that uh, that we would be doing. So excluding uh, the team that is running, these are field costs hiring the enumerators and so on. Uh, so overall, it wasn't like a large investment from World Vision. If you think of like the studies running from 2015 to 2017, um, nine of them um, less than um, uh, $200,000 for, uh, for sure. And uh, they were on the, um, undesignated funds. Right. They were not external funds. These programs were all child sponsorship uh, funds. Um, what we are seeing now is that we see USAID doing more um, more expos. We we have recently seen uh, more coming um, um, like uh, the BA processes where people are unpacking uh, exit strategies and so on. So maybe there is going to be more funding also on the grant side. I do not know how other organizations that are more grant funded or if we even if we looked at a grant funded uh, programs, where would that funding comes come from? Just in terms of the, the amount of investment you put in and also in terms of staff time and all of that, do you, um, do you or did the others who commissioned the study feel that the learning, the uptake of the knowledge justified that? So since you didn't come out with necessarily yeah. replicable models, um, were they satisfied with what you gave them and able to use it? It would depend on which month you are asking me. <laughs> when we finished the study, we were ecstatic. We were like, oh my God, so rich. We learned about things we did not know. Um, and then uh, you present the studies. There is like, oh, this is not what we were looking for. Uh, this doesn't justify what we wanted uh, it to say or something. So the, the down, there is like a, a downhill. Uh, organizational changes affect a lot of it. Uh, there were a couple of um, things that happened organizationally that we focus on, and right now uh, we are back on like this uh, half wave where we are sharing and talking with you, we're 
we've talked to our leadership, we're holding all these meetings, so there seems to be like a renewed uh, interest. So right now, I would say that it was worth the investment, even for asking the questions internally of um, what happens when funding ends. And I would just ask that um, even when people don't seem to be getting as much traction on some of the more salient findings that we think are there, we have a lot of avenues to influence some of the process findings. Um, like we do work, we have more uh, closer working relationships with the, the teams that create the guidance and the templates for transition planning and things like that. And so we've been able to also, um, I think, get more mileage out of our process findings, which sometimes is really encouraging. Sometimes, like Holta said, it, it's disappointing because it's, it's only one piece of such a rich amount. But um, it, it's been a couple of years, you know, so there's two sets of this, and and it keeps, it, it, tends, it seems to be paying off slowly, <laughs> but um, in, in multiple avenues. We just, uh, any last comments from uh, online? We had a question about whether World Vision is going to continue to fund X posts. This month, I would say yes. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking, uh, actually. No, uh, there is, these kinds of findings do not happen if uh, they don't have champions. Mm. Um, and they do not happen if they don't have uh, people that are curious to know. Um, they will find a way to get funded if there is um, there is people, uh, champions in the middle level, like people like Bridget, myself, Whitney, that won't drop the topic. It doesn't matter how many times we've restructured the kinds of jobs that we end up, we somehow gear it towards like, what about sustainability? So if you find those people in the organization, uh, the conversation will go. Um, we want to continue and we got from our leadership this idea that um, um, these are the kind of findings that we want. That was what I was last told. So that gives me hope that there will uh, there will be um, there will be continuation. I have less of the hopes that things will always be funded with uh, internal money. So that is the uh, the kind of uh, uh, looking at um, maybe the bigger uh, donors and being that comes with being vulnerable uh, and asking those donors um, whether um, you together be in this exploration journey, uh, putting your program out there for a review uh, one or two years after. In the meeting that we had in this, um, at Interaction with Melissa, I can't remember last name, uh, the director from, um, um, for evaluation and learning at USAID, when we asked this question, uh, her, um, she said, we don't have a designated pool of funding, but don't be shy and ask, ask uh, if you want to uh, partner in this. Um, so, I would say let's all push a little bit, <laughs> uh, both on, with the donors and internally, but find those champions or be those champions. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And leave us our con your contact. <laughs> And enjoy some food. Don't let us take it over.